I recently got a JS Tools bead roller from Trick Tools. This machine is new to the American market. It's made in Sweden by the same company that makes the excellent shrinker I've used for years. Today I'll show you what this versatile machine can do, and I'm sure you'll appreciate the special features that make it so versatile. The last demonstration will show the fabrication of an intricate car fender, and the bead roller will accomplish a great deal of the forming and detailing. Let's start with the basics. The machine has two shafts, which hold interchangeable dies. There's a wide assortment of dies available, and the modular design allows you to mix and match them in countless ways. There's a lot of bead rollers on the market, and the JS Tools machine has a number of unique features, as you'll see. It has a 24-inch throat depth, inch and 3 16 gap height, and a powerful variable speed motor controlled by forward and reverse foot pedals. It's rated for steel up to 18 gauge and aluminum up to 80 thousandths. There's over 50 die sets available for this machine. I'll start by rolling some beads, the feature the machine is named for. I have 3 millimeter beading dies mounted on the machine and I'm working with 20 gauge steel. I'm going to start a straight run down the center of this panel and then I'll move the panel slightly left and right to make some soft curves. So I need to set the pressure I'm going to bring the top die down until it just touches the metal and then I'll move the dies down about one and a quarter turns past that. That should be the correct pressure setting for this setup. And I'll start by making a straight run down the center and then I'll move the panel slightly left and right to make some soft curves near the center. So that's a typical bead. Now very often you'll want to have beads that are absolutely straight. So to do that I'm going to set an edge guide that will ride along the edge of the panel so I can make a perfectly straight bead. So the guide is very easy to set. I just loosen a knob on the guide, slide it wherever I want. I can lock the guide into place. And now I can get a perfectly straight bead. I can also use this same guide to follow a convex edge. So just to change things up, I'll put on the largest size die, which is 24 millimeter. These larger dies require a shorter spacer. I need to recenter the dies, and that's easily accomplished by loosening this lever, which frees the top shaft to move right and left. So I'll get the shaft centered and lock it into place. There's actually a lock on both sides, and you can use either one. And I'll reset the edge guide. So this larger die will take several passes. Let's get started with that. I'll bring the dies down until they just touch. And I'll go down two turns past that. Okay, I'll go down another turn. And one last turn. So that's formed a very nice bead. Now you can see the part is cupped a little bit. That's because I need to shrink this edge to pull it down straight. So that's done a nice job of straightening the panel. And I'll run it through the dies one more time to get the contour back in the part.
So that's done a great job of reshaping that. So it's a very regular curve now. So this is the largest size bead this machine is designed for, and this is the smallest. And there's a wide range in between. With traditional beading dies, the male die has a full round, and the female die has a pocket that matches. There's a special die that's called a half U, and what it can do is it can roll half of a bead. I have this all set up, so let me make a pass and show you what it does. I'll make one pass at partial depth. Then I'll go down to full depth, make a second pass. So basically we're forming half a bead. And if you want to make a bead that tapers, you can cut your piece of metal so it has a taper. And then you can make a second pass. And you can see that you'll be creating a bead that has a nice taper. So that's a very nice effect that would be difficult to do any other way. Most beading dies are round in section, but there's a few made that are square. Let me show you what that looks like. We'll make one pass at partial depth. And then make a second pass at full depth. So this one has a nice square profile. Another very common die is a step die, sometimes called an offset or joggle die. And they come in several different sizes. I'm using a one millimeter, which is a perfect match for this 20 gauge steel. So I'm going to make one pass on this, and it will step that edge down a little bit. And with that step down, I can put another piece of 20 gauge against this. They fit flush on the top side, so that makes a very, very nice joint. The roundover dies I developed work great on this machine. They require the use of a spacer. These are available from Trick Tools. So the spacer goes on the shaft, and I've drilled a hole in my spacer so I can use a pin to key the dies to the shaft. This isn't really necessary for the smaller dies, but sometimes it helps with the larger dies. And then there's a pin that goes in this hole. And that pin engages the keyway in the shaft. And then the top of the pin engages the keyway in the die. And then we'll tighten these onto the shafts. And they're all ready to go. So I have a crescent-shaped piece of metal that I'll use on this. I'll put the smallest round over on this edge. This is a 5 16 radius, so I'll get the pressure set for this. I'll find out where the dies just touch the metal, and then go just a little past that, and then run this through. Now the bottom die has a guide built into it, so all I need to do is to keep the edge of the metal against that guide, and I'll get a perfectly rounded over edge. And now I'll switch to the larger size. The next larger size is half inch. So I'll put those dies in place. I'll get the pressure set for this and run it through. So what these dies do is they put a perfect 45 degree curl on the edge of the metal. And in some cases you can do that just to finish the edge. It makes it stronger and it looks more finished. But I also use these a lot for making tanks. I can put a 45 degree curl on both pieces of the tank and then when they fit together I can weld it and sand the weld smooth and it makes a beautiful radius curve. There are two larger sizes of these dies, one inch and inch and a half radius. And I'll use both of those coming up soon when I make the fender. There's a special set of beading dies used for tubing. This is useful when you need to put a hose over a piece of tubing and seal it with a hose clamp so it puts a little rib on the tube so the clamp gets a good seal. So as you can see, the smallest die is made small enough to fit inside a piece of inch and a half tubing. 
And because the rollers are different sizes, they slide on the metal. So it's really good to use a little lubricant inside the tubing so the dies can slide around. So let's put some pressure on this and roll the tubing through the dies. And that's all it takes. So you can see that does an excellent job of putting a beautiful bead on round tubing. If you make a lot of round parts, you might consider making an outboard adjustable pivot for your machine. I made this one out of scrap material and it's pretty simple. There's a slider here with a pin on it, so your part would have a hole in it that slips over this pin, and then you can adjust this any distance you like from the dies. I'll pull this apart so you can see what the details look like. So this is a piece of inch and a half square tubing and I used an existing hole in the machine to hold it in place. So I just drilled a hole in the tubing and put a support on the back side that holds it level. So to assemble it, you just slip this into place. I use a punch to align the hole. And then I put a bolt through the hole. Put a nut and washer on the back side. And that stop on the back keeps this from being able to move down. It can hinge up, so to hold that tightly, I just use a C-clamp. And I put a pad on the jaw so it doesn't mar the paint. So this just slips up into place here. And that holds the back very securely. Then I can put the center pivot back into place. And let's get this set up to do a job. So I have a disc of metal here, and I'm going to use the round over dies on the edge of it. So I'll slip the part over the shaft, slide it into place, lock the pivot. And I like to put a mark on this so I know when I've made a complete round. So I'll use a felt tip marker for that. So I'll just start making passes on this, taking the edge down a little bit at a time. So I'll go down another full turn. and I'll bottom the dies out. Okay. So that's a great way to get a very consistent feature on a round piece of material. I'm going to keep going with this, so I'll make a series of circular beads on this disc now. So I'll get this centered between the dies. And the size of the first bead is 6 millimeters. So the dies have just contacted the metal and I'll go down one turn. And I'll run it through. And I'll go another quarter turn past that. So here's our first bead. The next die I'll use is 10 millimeter. I'll check to make sure the dies are still centered, and they are, so I'll get set up for the next bead. So the bead roller with the center pivot is a great way to make a pattern of concentric circles. There are louver dies available for this machine as well. And what's interesting about these dies is that not only can they make straight louvers, they can make curved louvers. 
and you can make louvers of any length you want. So we're going to use this rotary fixture to make a row of curved louvers. This is the panel I'll be working on, and you can see I put stops on it. This will ensure that the ends of the louvers all form a straight line. So I'll feed the panel between the dies, put it down over the pivot shaft, and I'll get set up for the first louver. I'll lock the pivot into place, and bring this down until the dies just touch the metal. Then I'll go down two turns past that. Go right up to the stop. And I'm at full depth now. So there's the first louver. So I'll release the dies. Lift the dies up. Slide it to the next position. Lock it in place. I'll get set up for the next louver. So there's the finished product. And again, this is one of the few machines that could make a curved louver. I'm going to make a fender, and you might be surprised to see how many operations can be completed on the bead roller. So this is the fender side, and I need to curl the top edge over to 45 degrees, all the way from front to back. The bottom edge gets a wire reinforcement, and there's also a bead that gets rolled on top of the wire and then there'll be a cap for the top and back of the fender and the cap will be made in two pieces there's a reverse curve area here which I'll break out as a separate part so the cap will be one piece from here to the back and one piece from here to the front so there's a number of operations to perform and I've thought through this pretty carefully so the first step is I'm going to put the curl on the back part of the fender from this point back it needs a smaller curl in the back than it does for the rest of it. So I have a one inch roundover die in the machine. And I'll use that die to roll the bead all the way from this point to this point, and it'll stop there. So let's get set up for that. You'll notice I have an outfeed table here to support the weight of the part. So I'm going to find where the dies bottom out. So right about there. So I'll bring this down to full pressure. And again, these dies have a guide built into them, so I just need to keep the edge of the metal against that guide as I feed the metal through. So the next thing I want to do is to put a wire in the bottom edge of the fender. And the first step for that is forming a flange. I need to make a die change to do that. These are the dies I use for flanging. On the top shaft I have a 3 millimeter beading die and that's the same size as the wire I'll be using. It's 8 inch wire which is just about 3 millimeters. On the bottom I have a flat die backed up by a die called a flame die. And basically I'm just using the flat surface of the flame die as a guide to ride the edge of the metal against. There's a formula for the width of the flange you need for a wired edge and it's two and a half times the wire diameter. I'm using eighth inch wire, so two and a half times that is five sixteenths. I like to add a little extra. So five sixteenths is three hundred twelve thousandths. I'm going to go to three hundred fifty thousandths. So I need to offset these dies three hundred fifty thousandths. And I'll use a dial caliper to set that distance. And I'll lock the top shaft in place. So now I'm ready to do the flanging. When I'm flanging, I like to make a pass with just a little pressure on the dies, holding the material flat. 
And what this does is it just gives me a feel of how to handle the material so I can move it evenly. But it also puts just a tiny, tiny little depression in the metal. And that makes it easier for the flange to form. So I'm bumping the foot pedal to make it go slowly around this tight corner. And then I can just follow that guide on the lower shaft so I can be sure that my flange will be a constant width. You can see how the outfeed table is holding the weight of the part now. To make a flange, I have to put upward pressure on this as it goes through the dies. So I put a vice grip on here to give me a little bit more leverage. And as I roll it through this time, I'll apply just a little bit of upward pressure. I'm only going to about 10 degrees or so. So far, so good. So I'll keep repeating this, giving it a little more angle with each pass. My outfeed table is actually in the way now, so I'll move it. So I'm getting a nice angle on that, and I'll keep going. So the end of the part is just about hitting the floor. One nice thing about this machine is you can change the angle of the upper part of it so it can accommodate longer parts. You can drop it down if you have a low ceiling as well. So that's a very nice feature. I have just a little ways to go. And this time I'm holding the metal tight up against the upper die. So mostly it's shaping very nicely, but you can see in the most tightly radiused areas, it needs a little shrinking on that flange. So that's shaping up really well. I'll put this back on the table so we can gauge its flatness. I made a few small corrections on this with a hammer and dolly, and you can see it's very close to being flat. Now I want to take that 90 degree angle and turn it into a J shape. 
And I'll show you the die setup that I use for that. I'm using a 3mm beading die on the top. I'll put a couple of spacers on the bottom shaft. And then I'll put a 6mm beading die on the bottom. I'll add another spacer. And this is just a flat disc I made from Delrin plastic. So that's the stack up of dies. I'll get them tightened onto the shaft. And I'll show you how this die set works. I've set it up so there's just enough room for one material thickness between this die and this die. And I'm going to crank this down two turns, make a pass. I'll go down two more turns. And one more turn should finish it. So that really does a nice job. So I'll run the fender side through the dies now. I'll go down two more turns. And I'll bring it down to full depth. So it's a done deal. And it came out great. Years ago I did this work by hammering. This is so much faster with the bead roller. It's time to fit the wire into the fender edge. So I freehand bent this, but I did get a very nice fit. And it just tucks nicely into that J-shaped groove. And I'll hold it into place with vice grips. I've actually modified these vice grip pliers slightly. I've welded a little tongue onto one of the jaws. And the function of that is it enables the vice grips to press the wire tightly into the base of that J-shaped groove. So I'm ready to take this to the bead roller and tighten the sheet metal around the wire. So I have another special die combination for this task. I'll put a couple of spacers on the bottom shaft and then a die with a broad flat face and then a flat die. And I need to adjust the position of the top shaft. I made a test piece, and I'm going to use that to gauge where this top die needs to go. And I'll snug it up really well. This time I'll use the lock on both sides of the shaft because this puts a lot of side loading on it. So this will make it easy to tighten the sheet metal around the wire. I'll make a couple of passes with this. The first pass will trap the wire. Now I'll move the clamp down farther. Okay, I'll tighten the dies and make another pass. Well, that came out absolutely fantastic. Nice and tight against the wire. Now I'll use the inch and a half round over die to finish the curl on the top part of the fender side. Yeah, 
and I'll wind the pressure down. So that's come out great. Usually it takes a little straightening after using the roundover dies. You can see it has a little rock to it, and the fix for that is to shrink this edge a little bit. So by carefully shrinking that edge, I was able to pull it down very flat. The next step is forming a bead over the wired edge, and there's a special set of dies for that. These are called the 32 Ford wire bead dies. There's a groove in the bottom die designed to accept the wired edge. So you orient the panel so the wires in the groove, run the panel through, and it tracks right over the wire, making a perfect bead. So now I'll run the fender side through these dies. I'll turn the speed down for this last little bit. So there's the bead. I'm going to put a curl on the end of the part, and I've made a pattern to guide me. I put a registration mark on both the part and the pattern to keep them aligned as I make the bend. I've clamped a piece of tubing to my bench to help make the bend. I'll start the bend near the front and work toward the rear, checking the pattern as I go. I welded a temporary handle on the part to give me more leverage near the end. It's coming great so far. And that is just about perfect. I'll use the shrinker to pull these wrinkles out of the edge. The shrinker took the big bumps out of this edge, and I'll go over it lightly with a hammer and dolly to get the final smoothness. I'll use the English wheel to shape the fender cap. This piece goes all the way from the front back to the area where the reverse curve starts. And this piece stays flat in the front because that's where the running board attaches to the fender, but I want the rest of it to have a 50 inch radius all the way to the back edge. So I have a low crown wheel in the machine and I'm going to start the shaping on this piece. I finished the shaping on this, so let's try it against the fender side and see how it matches it. So I kept it perfectly flat in the front. We're looking good there. Up here I want to have that 50 inch radius. And it's looking excellent there. So we're looking good here. And looking good here. I'm going to form a 1 inch flange on the inner edge of this fender cap. And I have a special set of dies put on the machine. There's a wide flat die on the bottom. Narrow flat die on the top and there's a stop I put on the inner edge of the lower die and I've adjusted the dies so it's one inch from this edge of this die to the stop. So all I need to do is to roll the metal through and make sure it's touching that stop at all times. I'll be lifting up a little bit with my right hand. So I've only put a small angle on this, but you can see it's opening up the panel. 
That's to be expected because this flange will have to shrink as it moves down. So I'll work this flange on the shrinker. Now I'll go back to the flanging dies. And I'll lift up a little bit more on the right side. Now I'll go back to the shrinker. So I'm up to a full 90 degrees on this flange. I'll check this with the fender side and I'm sure I'll have to adjust the contour a little bit to get a perfect fit. So I've done all the tune-up work on this part. You can see that flange lays absolutely flat and I made a pattern that shows me the shape that flange needs to have. So I'll put the pattern into place and you can see that I have an excellent fit. So the next step is to curl over the outer edge of this part. So I'm set up with the roundover dies. I'll do pretty much the whole edge, but I do want to leave one section flat. That's where the running board mounts to the fender. So I'll start at the back edge and work toward the front. So the edge is curled and you can see I got some nasty kinks. That's really to be expected because these dies are trying to make the metal shrink and it resists the shrinking by forming these kinks. It's pretty much straight in the areas between the kinks. So of course the fix is to shrink this edge and once I've shrunk the whole edge I'll go back through these dies one more time to recontour this edge. And I'll run it through the roundover dies one more time to help restore the contour at the edge. So it's looking pretty good. I'll try this against the fender side and I'm sure it will take a few small adjustments. I spent a little more time tweaking and adjusting both these parts, but they're really fitting together well now. So this fit up is good enough to start the tack welding process, and I'll do that off camera. With the pieces tack welded, you can see just how well the shapes flow together. And the next step is to shape the piece that goes in the rear of the fender. I'll do this off camera with an English wheel, and this is a reverse curve. So the English wheel did a great job of forming this reverse curve. And you'll see that it's a good match for the shape top to bottom. And it still matches the sweep with the 50 inch radius from right to left. So now I'll use the bead roller to form the flange on the inner edge. This is the same die setup I used for the other part. So I'll keep this edge against the guide on the lower shaft. And just start running the panel through while putting a little bit of upward pressure on it. I'll make another pass, bringing it up a little higher, and one more pass. So each time I bend this flange, I'm going to change the curvature a little bit. So I'll check this with my template, and I can regain that curvature by stretching this edge. Check it with my template again. Looks a lot better. Needs to bend a little bit more right here. 
That's close enough. So I'll go back to the bead roller. Give it some more upward pressure. One more pass. One of the features of this machine is that the fasteners that hold the dies to the shaft are fitted flush. There's nothing that sticks out on the ends of the dies. And this is actually very important because if your goal is to make a 90 degree flange, if there's any fasteners sticking out, that will prevent you from making a 90 degree flange. And very few beading machines have this recessed fastener feature. I'm going to go all the way up to 90 on this pass. And then I'll have to correct this shape one more time. The top part of this looks pretty good, but from this point down, it needs more stretching. A little bit more in this area. A little bit more right here. And that's quite a good fit against my radius template. So now I'll use the roundover die to curl this edge over. So the inch and a half roundover dies are set up. I'll make one pass keeping this edge a little ways away from the guide. That'll start moving the metal over. And now I'll make a pass with this edge tight against the guide. So this has probably changed our contour a little bit. I can use the same template for this portion. And you can see it needs to be stretched, mostly just in this one area here. A little bit more in this area. That looks pretty good. I'll make one more pass through the roundover dies, which will help smooth out this area. And I'll check it one more time with my template. That's looking quite good. So now I'll start fitting this to the fender. I have this piece clamped into place and the fit up's looking really good. So I'm going to mark the inside for trimming. So I'll pull this apart, trim on the line, and I'll be ready to tack weld these together. I tuned up this corner with a hammer and dolly, but you can see how well the parts fit together now. So I've tack welded this panel into place, and now you can really get a sense of how the parts of the fender fit together. So I'll finish weld this off camera, I'll metal finish it, and then we'll take a look at the finished fender. So here's the finished fender. As you've seen, the majority of the detailing was done with the bead roller, and it really helped to make a high quality product. I think now you can appreciate just how versatile this machine is and how it can speed and add precision detail into your work. Thanks to Trick Tools for sponsoring this video and you can contact them for more information on the JS Tools bead roller. Special thanks to Lassie Jansen who really opened my eyes to all that a bead roller can do.